chapter 4. Had it proved of any help that the Reverend had tried to follow the advice of Epictetus, to keep before him every day death, exile and loss, believing it a condition of his spiritual contract with the world as given? When the French sail came a twinkling, with never quite invisible death upon the wherefore and aft, with no place at all safe and only the unhelpful sea for escape, amid the soprano cries of the powder monkeys, the smell of charred wood, the muzzles, iron breath, how had these daily devotions, he now, under, he now wondered, ultimately ever been of use, how in the snug shambles of the seahorse. To the children, he remarks aloud, of course, prayer was what got us through. I should have prayed, murmurs cousin Athelma to Tenebrae's mild astonishment. Since appearing in the doorway during a difficult bit of double back stitch filling two days ago, returned from college in the jerseys, he has otherwise been all boldness. Not seized a match? Not gone running up and down the deck, screaming and lighting guns as you went? Cousin! The twins consult each other's fizz, pretending to be stricken. Athelma smiles and amiably pollocates the Reverend and less certainly Mr. Lespark, his own uncle, as if to say, we are surrounded by the pious and their well-known wish never to hear of anything that sets the blood erasing. Bray looks away, but keeps him in the corner of her eye as if to reply, boy, blood may race as quietly as it must. Mr. Lespark made his fortune years before the war, selling weapons to the French and British, settlers and Indians alike, knives, tomahawks, rifles, hand cannons in the old Dutch style, grenades, small bombs. Trouble yourself not, he liked to assure his customers over diameter. If there are account books in which casualties are the units of exchange, then, so it seems to Athelma, his uncle is deeply in arrears. Athelma has heard tales of past crimes, but can hardly assault his host with accusations. Everyone knows, that is, considering Uncle Wade as some collection of family stories, everyone remembers. Some adventures have converged into a saga that is difficult to reconcile with the living uncle, who sends him bank drafts on whims inscrutable that catch the nephew ever by surprise, fre frequents the horse races in Maryland, actually once fed apples to the great Selim, and these days doesn't mind if a Thelma comes along to visit the stables. At the late autumn meet, gaily dressed young women, fancier than he thought possible, had waved and smiled, indeed come over bold as city cats to engage Athelma in conversation. Though young, he was shrewd enough to smoke that what they were after was his plainness, including an idea of his innocence, which they failed to note was long, even enjoyably, departed. He wants what? Mason nodding with a sour smile. Out of our expenses? Shall it leave us enough for candles and soap, do you guess? No one's sure, Captain Smith having not himself appeared before the council. Rather, his brother came and read them the captain's letter. 
an hundred pounds a piece and hundred guineas. Eh, that suggests they expect someone to come back with a counteroffer. As it isn't hers, who would that be? It comes down to the Royal Sock or the Royal Inn, as Mason has heard it. The council milled about like domestic fowl and perplexity, repeating proportional share in tones of outrage. Proportional share? Leaving this, this post captain, the right to lay it out, as he calls it, at his pleasure. Some captain, step away from a privateer by God. Aggrieved voices echoing in the stairwell, silver ringing upon silver, sugar loaves and assorted biscuits, French brandy and coffee, stick flourishes, motes of wig powder jigging by the thousands in the candlelight. Immediately ra raising a particular suspicion, unworthy of this captain goes without saying, and yet not to be easily distinguished from petty extortion. Quite the sort of behaviour Lord Anson's forever on about eradicating. And other remarks in the same line, reports Mason. They were just able, to, uh, just able at last to appoint a committee of two to wait upon Lord Anson himself, who took the time to inform them that in the Royal Navy, a ship of war's captain is expected to pay for his own victualling. Really? said Mr. Mead. I didn't know that, my lord. Are you quite... I didn't mean that. Of course you're sure, but rather... His thought being, endeavoured Mr. White, that all this time we'd rather imagined that the Navy... Alas, gentlemen... One of many sacrifices necessary to that strange servitude we style command, replied the First Lord. Howbeit, it will depend largely on how much your captain plans to drink and how many livestock he may feel comfortable living among. Hardly do to be slipping in goat shit whilst trying to get ten or twelve guns off in proper sequence sort of thing. At the same time, we cannot have our frigate captains adopting the ways of street bullies. And this approach to one's guests, hmm, it does seem a bit singular. We'll have Stevens or someone send Captain Smith a note, shall we? Invoking gently my own poised thunderbolt, of course. Oh dear, Captain Smith upon the quarter deck in the winter's grudged sunlight, the letter fluttering in the breeze from the direction of London, somewhere among a peaked convoy of clouds, a steady mutter as of displeasure on high. And yet I knew it, didn't I? Ah, misunderstood. Far from any extortion scheme, it had rather been the captain's own expectation, the fancy of a heart unschooled in guile, that they would of course all three be messing together day upon day, the voyage long, in his quarters, drinking Madeira, singing catches, exchanging sallies of wit and theories about the stars. How else, he being of such a philosophical leaning, and so starved for discourse, it never occurred to him that other arrangements were even possible. I assumed foolishly that we'd go in equal thirds, and meant to ask but your share of what I hoped to be spending, out of my personal funds, upon your behalf. Not to mention that buying for three at certain chandleries would have got me a discount. Ah, what matter? Best of intentions, gentlemen. No wish to offend the First Lord, our great circumnavigator after all. My hero is a lad. We regret it, sir. Dixon offers far too much whim -wham. Mason brings his head up with a surprised look. Saintly of you, considering your screams could be heard out past the Isle of Wight. Now, previously unconsulted, I am expected to join this love fest? Dixon and the captain, as if in conspiracy, beam sweetly back till Mason can abide no more. Very well, though someone ought to have told you, captain. 
of that rutabagous anemia which afflicts lensmen as a class. The misunderstanding then should never have arisen. Gracious of you, Mr. Mason, cries Dixon heartily. Most generous, adds the captain. Tis arranged at last that they will be put in the lieutenant's mess, which is financed out of the ship's account, that is, by the Navy, and take their turn with the other principal officers in dining with the captain, whose dreams of a long, uneventful voyage and plenty of philosophic conversation would thus have been abridged even had the Legrand never emerged above the horizon. On the 8th of December, the captain has an express from the Admiralty ordering him not to sail. Furthermore, he, is, he informs Mason and Dixon, Ben Coolin is in the hands of the French. I see no mention of any plans to retake the place soon. I am sorry. I knew it. Dixon walking away, shaking his head. We may still make the Cape of Good Hope in time, says Captain Smith. That'll likely be our destination if and when they cut the orders. No one else is going there to observe, Mason says. Odd, isn't it? You'd think there'd be a team from somewhere. Captain Smith looks away as if embarrassed. Perhaps there is he suggests, as gently as possible. As they proceed down the channel, Aye, and that's the tale of the bolt, a sailor informs them, where the Ramillies went down but a year February, losing 700 souls. They were in southwest weather, the sailing master could not see, he gambled as to which headland it was, mistaking the bolt for ram head, and lost all. This is league for league, the most dangerous body of water in the world, complains another. Sands and streams, banks and races, have no peace to wear past the start point and headed for the sea. Can this lad get us out all right? Oh, young Smith's been round forever, collier sailor. If he's alive, he must have learned somewhat. Passing the start point at last the coxcomb of hilltops to starboard, the ship leaning in the up-channel wind, the late sun upon the heights, more brilliant gold and blue than either landsman has ever seen, the cold of approaching night carrying an edge, the possibility that by morning the weather will be quite brisk indeed. Sumatra, sing the sail, sailors of the seahorse, where girls all look like Cleopatra, and when you're done you'll simply barter her for yet another twice as hot tra la 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 From the day he assumed command of the seahorse, Captain Smith has lived in a tidy corner of hell, previously unfamiliar to him. Leaving the rain-swept landing, rode out into the wet, heaving groves of masts and spars upon Spithead. Mid sewage and tar and the breath of wind, he had searched with increasing desperation for some encouraging first sight of his new command, till obliged at last to accept the remote, scruffy, sixth-rate, throwing itself like a tethered beast against its anchor cables, Yet, yet, through the crystalline spray, how gilded comes she, how corpusently edged in a persisting and, if glories there be, glorious light. And he knows her, it must be from a dream, how could it be other, a light in which all pain and failure, all fear, are bleached away. He had been greeted at the quarter deck by a youth of loutish and ungathered appearance, recruited but recently in a press-gang sweep of whopping, who exclaimed, Damn! Look at this, boys! An officer what knows enough to come out of the rain! Trying not to bark, Captain Smith replied, What's your name, sailor? By some I be styled Blinky, 
and who might you be? Attend me, Blinky, I am the captain of this vessel. Well, advised the young salt, you've got a good job. Don't fuck up. Steady advice. He haunts his little raider like a nearly unsensed ghost, now silent upon his side of the quarter deck, now bending late and dutifully over the lunar distance forms. He wishes to be taken as a man of science, opines the reverend upon first meeting the astronomers. Perhaps he even seeks your own good opinion, mentioned in a report to the Royal Society, however you do that sort of thing. Choosing to stand with the ingenious and philosophical wing of the naval profession rather than its traditional and bloody-minded one, though he would fight honourably, Captain Smith does not consider his best game to be war. The vessel herself, however, enjoys a reputation for nerve. Having proved it at Quebec, fearless under the French batteries of Beauport, part of a division, diversion whilst the real assault proceeded quite upon the other flank, out of the troop carrying ships that had sailed past the city further upstream. Thenceforward, thenceforward is her glory assured. She has done her duty in the service of a miracle in that year of miracles, 1759, upon whose Ides of March Dr. Johnson happened to remark, No man will be a sailor who has contrivance enough to get himself into jail, for being in a ship is being in a jail with the chance of being drowned. Some would call her a frigate. Though officially she is a couple of guns shy, causing others to add the prefix jackass, a nautical term. Neither names nor modest throw weights have kept her from mixing it up with bigger ships. Captain Smith has long understood that though a seahorse may be born in spirit an Arab stallion, sometimes must it also function as a jackass, a creature known, that is, as much for its obstinacy in an argument as for its trick of turning and using its hind legs as a weapon. Therefore I want the best gun crew for the stern cannon. Let this jackass show them a deadly kick. When the Legrand comes a-looming, nevertheless, the captain is more than a little surprised. Why would Monsieur be taking the trouble, knowing the answer to be frigate business, built into the definition of the command, in return for freedom to range upon the sea, one was bound by a code as strict as that of any ancient knight. The seahorse's motto, lovingly embroidered by a certain needlewoman of South Sea and nailed above the bed in his captain, cap cabin, reads Equus sit Equus. Now, Equus, according to the helpful young Reverend Wicks Cherry Coke, means an armed horseman. Ranging the land, Dixon suggests, as a frigate sail of the sea. Later, in old Rome, it came to mean a sort of knight, a gentleman, somewhere between the ordinary people and the senate. Sit as may he be, and equus means just, also perhaps even tempered. So we might take your ship's motto to mean, let the sea knight who would command the sea horse be ever fair-minded. Trying not to lose his temper, even with boil brain subordinates, the captain growling thus at Lieutenant Unchley, who stands timidly signalling for his attention. Um... What appears to be a sail south southwest, although there is faction upon the question, others insisting tis a cloud. Damnation, Unchley, Captain Smith in a low voice, reaching for his glass. Hellfire, too. If it's a Frenchman, he's seen us and is making all sail. I knew that, said the lieutenant. Here, don't drop this. Get up the mask and mast and tell me exactly what and where it is. Take Bodine up with you, with a watch and compass. And if it proves to be a sail, do try to obtain a few nicely spaced magnetical bearings. There's a good lieutenant. You'll note how very scientific we are here, gentlemen. Yet, turning to a group of sailors wholly stoning the deck, ancient 
beliefs will persist. Here then, Bongo. Yes, yes, Captain wishes excellent Bongo. Smell wind. The Lascar, so addressed, crying, Aye, aye, Captain, springs to the windward side, up on a rail and grasping some armful of the four shrouds, presses himself far into the wind, head rag a fluttering, almost immediately turning his head with a look of savage glee. Frenchies! Hard a port, calls the captain, as down from the main top comes word that the object does rather appear to be a sail, at least so far unaccompanied and, and, and is withal running express, making to intercept the seahorse. Gentlemen, "'Twould oblige me if you'd find ways to be useful below.' The drum begins its beat. They have grown up, English boys, never far from the sea, with tales of its battles and pirates and isles just off the coasts of paradise. They know what below promises. At first it seems but a toy ship, a toy destiny. The gallants and staysails go crowding on, but the wind is obstinate south-south-west. The seahorse may but ever beat against it, in waters treacherous of stream, whilst the Lagrand is fresh out from breast, with the wind on her port quarter. Twas small work to come up with us, get to leeward, from which the French prefer to engage and commence her broadsides, the seahorse responding in kind for an hour and a half of blasting and smashing and masts falling down. Blood flowing in the scuppers, cries Pitt. Did you swing on a rope with a knife in your teeth? asks Pl Pliny. Of course, and a pistol in my boot. Uncle, Bray disapproves. The reverend only beams. One reason humans remain young so long compared to other creatures is that they, yet the young are useful in many ways, among them in providing daily, by way of the evil creatures and slaughter they love, a denial of mortality. Clamorous enough to allow their elders release, if only for moments at a time, from its claim upon the attention Sad to say, boys, I was well below and preoccupied with sea surgery, learning what I needed to know of it upon the spot. By the end of the engagement, I was left with nothing but my faith between me and absolute black panic. Afterward, from whatever had happened upon that patch of secular ocean, I went on to draw lessons more abstract. Watching helplessly as we closed with the Lagrand, I felt that with each fraction of a second, death was making itself sensible in new ways. We were soon close enough to hear the creak and jingling of the gun tackle and the rumble of trucks upon the deck, then to see the ends of the rammers backing through the gun ports and vanishing as cartridges and wads were pushed into place, and the high-pitched foreign jabbering as we leaned ever closer broadsides again and again, punctuated by tacking so as to present the guns of the other side, ringing cessations in which came the thumps of reloading, the cries of the injured and dying, nausea, speechlessness, sweat pouring, then broadsides once more. Each time the firing stopped there seemed hope for a minute that we'd got away and it was over until we'd hear the gun tackle being shifted and feel in the dark the deck trying to tilt us over, charged with the moments upon the downward roll just before the guns vibrating in a certain way we had come to expect. And when it came no more, we stood afraid to breathe because of what might be next. The astronomers and I, meanwhile, endured intestinal agonies so as not to be the first to foul his breaches in front of the others. As the spars came crashing from above and the cannon sent sharp thuds through the ship, lay cruel fists boxing our ears, 
knocked cockroaches out of the overhead, blows his personal malevolence was more frightening even than their scale. The ship's hoarse creaking, a great sea animal in pain, the textures of its cries nearly those of a human voice when under great stress. Although Dixon is heading off to Sumatra with a member of the Church of England, that is, the ancestor of troubles, a stranger with whom he moreover but hours before was carousing exactly like sailors, shameful to say, yet erring upon the side of conviviality, will he decide to follow Fox's advice and answer that of God in Mason finding it soon enough with the battle all round them when both face their equal chances of imminent death. Dissolution, noise and fear. Below decks, reduced to nerves, given into the emprise of forces invisible yet possessing great weight and speed, which contend in some phantom realm they have had the bad luck to blunder into. The astronomers abide, willing themselves blank yet active. Casualties begin to appear in the sick bay, the wounds inconceivable. From oak splinters and chain and shrapnel, and as blood creeps like evening to dominion over all surfaces, so grows the ease of giving in to panic fear. It takes an effort to act philosophical, or even to find ways to be useful. But a moment's refocusing proves enough to show them each how at least to keep out of the way, and presently to save steps for the loblolly boy, or run messages to and from other parts of the ship. After the last of the gunfire, oak beams shuddering with the chase, the lazarette is crowded and piled with bloody men, including Captain Smith with a great splinter in his leg, his resentment especially powerful. I'll have lost 30 of my crew. Are you two really that important? Above, on deck, corpses are steaming. Wreckage is everywhere. Shreds of charred sail and line clatter in the wind that is taking the Frenchman away. What conversation may have passed between the post-captain and the commandant? He wore the order of the Holy Ghost, the white dove plainly visible through the glass. Saint Fu, almost certainly, yet commanding a different ship. What was afoot here? Had the Frenchman really signalled? France is not at war with the sciences. Words so magnanimous and yet went poo-poo, he did, sort of flicking his gloves about. I'm wasting my time, he said. You are little menu. I threw you back. Perhaps some day we meet when you are bigger fish, like me. Meanwhile I sail away. Poo-poo, adieu. Nevertheless, Captain Smith had replied, we must give chase. One of those French shrugs. You must, and of course, may. But she too is wounded. They watch the perfect ellipse of the Lagrand stern dwindle into the dark. At last, well before the mid-watch, Captain Smith calls off the chase, and they come about again, the wind remaining as it has been, and with what sail they have, they return to the Plymouth dockyard. Some at the time said there had been another sail, and that the Frenchman, assuming it to be a British man of war, had in fact broken off and headed back into Brest as speedily as her condition would allow. Some on the seahorse thought they'd seen it. Most had not. Perhaps our guardian angel, the reverend comments, instead of wings, top gallants. A year before, morale aboard the Lagrand, never high to begin with, had seemed to suffer an all but mortal blow with news of the disaster to the Brest fleet at Kyberon Bay. 
In calculating her odds vis-à-vis the seahorse, the invisible gamesters who wager daily upon the doings of commerce and government must have discounted her advantage in guns and broadside weight, noting that a crew so melancholic is not the surest guarantee of prevailing in a naval dispute. Yet, considered as a sentient being, the French ship continued to display the attitude of an undersized but bellicose sailor in a wine shop, always upon the quivive for a scrap, never quite reaching the level of glory it desired, always tétant dernier of the squadron, never ever chosen for the least hopeful missions, from embargo patrols off steaming red dawn coasts below the equator to rescue attempts beneath the shadows of the mountainous waves of winter storms in the Atlantic, forever unthanked, disrespected, labouring on, beating now alone at night, back into breast for new spars and riggings and lives. Oh, la Frenche, with a certain debonair little mordant upon the e, uh, ne fait pas le re contre les sciences. Sung incessantly till the ship made port, and then by the working parties at the quay, with the sour cadences of sailors in a distress not altogether bodily, humiliated, knowing better, yet unable to keep from humming the catchy fragment, its text instantly having joined the company of great humorous naval quotations, which would one day also include, I have not yet begun to fight, and there's something wrong with our damned ships ships today, Chatfield. Long after nightfall, Mason and Dixon, officially relieved of their medical duties, reluctant to part company, go lurching up on deck, exhausted, laughing at nothing or at everything, being alive when they could so easily be dead. Despite the salt rush of wind, they can no more here than below escape, caught in the drape of the damaged sails, the reek of the battle past, the insides of trees and of men, They have to prop each other up till one of them finds something to lean against. Well, what's this then? inquires Mason. More like a transit of Mars. With us going across its face. We're less of a cheery lad, why? I'd almost think it has occurred to me. They knew the French had been coolin'. What else did they know? That's what I'd like to know. Are you appropriating that bottle for reasons I may not wish to hear, or are thank ye? They pass the bottle back and forth, and when it is empty, they throw it in the sea and open another. You motherfucker.